hell could be breaking loose around me. But when Jesus is the anchor of my soul, he is the anchor of my mind, my will, and my emotions. Where my thoughts want to take me one place, or where my emotions want to make me fight, or, or my emotions want to make me uh, get depressed and kill myself, what is able to keep me is the spirit man, the inner man on the inside uh, that is connected with God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, get up on your feet in the house, family. Come on, are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Come on, stand on your feet. Come on in the house. Let's begin to give God some praise. Come on, lift up your voice and just give him one shout of praise right now. Come on, magnify his name because he's good. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Come on and bless his name. Somebody just put those hands together real quick. Come on, come on, put those hands together. Come on, praise God like you mean it. Come on, shake the week off and let's give God praise today. Come on, glory to God. Let's go. Come on. Hey. Let's declare the praises of our God. Let's rejoice in our Lord. Let's rejoice in our Lord. God, we bless your name. Oh, Lord, we lift you up. Jesus, we exalt your name, Lord. Kingdoms will bow down. Oh, and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle. Will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Oh Lord, we declare your praise.
there'll be one big choir this morning and worship God together. Water you turned into wine and open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. Y'all got it. Come on. There's none like you. Hey. And into the darkness we shine. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. And we sing our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Got you are higher than me. Our God is healer, awesome and power, our God, see our God, yeah, come on if you know he's a great God, let's go higher family, let's worship him this morning, come on and lift your voice with us into the darkness, into the darkness we shine, and out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you There's none like you Come on, one big choir, here we go Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power Our God, our God for us then who could ever stop us and if our god is with us then what can stand against and if our god is for us then who could ever stop us and if our god is with us then what can stand again come on and if our god is for us y'all got it then who could ever stop us? hey If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand again? Hallelujah, what can stand against us? Nothing can stand. Come on, y'all, let's go. Say it. He's 
a great God. Hallelujah. Our God is great. Our God is stronger. Higher than anything. Hallelujah. Our God's a healer. He's awesome in power. He's our God. Come on, make it personal. Our God is great. Our God is strong. Got you a higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God, our God is greater, our God is strong, God you are, oh our God, awesome is our God, our God. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Jesus. To stretch those hands and worship Him. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is can. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus and he's never let me down faithful through generation so why would he fail now sing it out come on somebody believe that in their spirit this morning that he won't fail serve a God that won't fail. I still got joy in chaos. Yes. I got peace that makes no sense and I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength cause I put my life on Jesus and he's never let down, faithful through every season, so why would he fail now? <laughs> Come on, loosen up just a little bit if you know God won't fail. That's it, one choir all over the house, just lift it up and say it. Come on, let the devil know. You got to look the devil right in the face and tell him, I'm not going nowhere. God won't fail me. Hallelujah. Say it. He won't fail. He won't fail. Here we go. Christ is. Let's go. Christ is my firm found. come and the wind blow but if you're built on the word of God you're gonna last hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus the winds came the wind blew 
But my house was built on you Now I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through Say rain came, wind blew But my house, my house was built on you I'm safe, I'm safe in your arms
on Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. You know what I'm talking about this morning? That's love. Come on and say it with me. Say Jesus came on Calvary. That's love. Lift those hands all over the building. This morning, just let the love of God sweep over you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just let his love sweep over you this morning. Come on, just open your mouth for a minute and just let the love of God sweep over you. Let his love sweep over you. Glory to God. We just want to encourage your hearts. It's due season, family. I found out that there were five seasons for the Christian. We have summer, spring, winter, and fall. But I was reading in Galatians 6 and 9, Pastor Fiona, and it says, don't get weary in well-doing because in due seasons. If you a believer, we got five seasons. Some of, come on, give God some praise. It's due season for the believer. Come on and give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah, it's due season. Glory to God, family. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. I love the presence of the Lord, family. Thank God that we are present in his presence. And somebody beside you, look at you. You got, you got somebody great standing beside you right now. I don't know if you know that. But they're made in God's image. So won't you turn to the left and the right of them. Tell them, saying, look at you. Look how good you look today. Come on, look at the grace of God all over you. And show them your teeth. Don't mean mug them. No gang banging in the church, family. Hallelujah. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord. When you get through greeting each other, family, you can have your seats. And let's pay attention to the announcements. Hallelujah. For the WCC family and friends, my name is Parrish Watson. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to service today. I pray that you are blessed in today's service and that you come back and join us again. In times like these, it's really important that we stay informed and connected. So here's a rundown of everything you need to know that's happening here at WCC. Hi, are you new to our WCC family? Welcome to you. We also invite you to stop in our guest lounge at our welcome desk in the lobby directly after service. We would love to say hello. Looking to go deeper in your walk with Christ? There is still time to join in on our foundation classes that meet Sunday mornings at 8.45 a.m. at our Carroll Stream campus. 
This is a great opportunity to learn and participate in rich discussions about our faith. Our Aurora campus is hosting a special set of Sunday morning classes entitled Faith and Finances with Pastor Lawrence Neon. Each first Sunday at 9 a.m., Pastor Lawrence will share important information on how to manage your finances from a kingdom perspective. All are welcome to attend. Our SWAT, Students with the Testimony Youth Ministry, is collecting gently used WCC t-shirts to use for a special project. If you have some old WCC merch that you would like to donate, please drop it off at the SWAT kiosk in the lot. Our men of excellence are meeting for fourth Saturday prayer at our Carroll Stream campus from 6 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Continental breakfast will be served after prayer and our very own Pastor Paul will have a special message for the men. Men, be sure to register on the church center today. You don't want to miss this. Thank you so much for joining us today. To view any of these announcements, please visit our website to stay up to date. And Wheaton Christian Center family, isn't Jesus wonderful? Amen. Enjoy the rest of the service. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Good to see you all this morning. So I have Pastor Sheila up here who's going to announce a little bit of something about the boot camp. Okay, I, um, I was asked to announce about, say something about the boot camp. Really, the question is, what is boot camp? I know when, I don't know if you, you anybody, anyone of the women have been in the army, but when you go to boot camp, when you say boot camp, you have to work, you have to learn, you have to accomplish, know how to, how to shoot, an ar shoot a, uh, a gun, do the target. You need to know how to exercise, get up early in the morning. And uh, you, you have sergeants in the army that will tell you, you know, yell at you and everything. Boot camp is rough. And when they asked me today how to announce it, I started thinking, ah, boot camp, we're going to have boot camp. Do you know what you're in for? Do you want to come? <laughs> because when you leave boot camp, you should know we have an enemy. Mm. And usually when we go to war, we have to know how to defeat the enemy. And so we have the we will learn, everybody say learn, learn, how to use our equipment to defeat the enemy. So we're not going to boot camp for you to spend time with your friends. Boot camp is not a time when you say, I'm just going to chill out and have a weekend. It's not a vacation. Boot camp is work. Are you prepared to work? We live in a society right now where we see the enemy all around us and we are powerless. We are powerless, but as Christians that are women of war, in the Bible, it says in the last days, woman, what did I say? Woman. Woman. Everybody say woman. Woman. Will have their dead mm. raise up to life again. Mm. Women will see when we go to boot camp, we're supposed to love, learn. Everybody say learn. Learn. how to defeat the enemy. We should know that the word of God is going to be, it's not time. Our committees have to spend time in prayer. 
not just meetings, prayer. Prayer is work. Prayer is when we go to God and we, we, we ask God to deliver us from anything that would hinder us from achieving what we want to achieve. Because in these days, the enemy has come down in great wrath. And we need to go out into the world. And we need to be a witness in the world. And we need to overcome the world. So boot camp, if you want to sign up for boot camp, we need to see some answers to our prayers. We've been going around this mountain for years. Now we want to see some answers. God help each one of the women that come to boot camp. You have to come, come go to boot camp with a mind, determination, that what you ask God for, when you leave that boot camp, you'll have it. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Amen, amen, amen. Isn't God good? All right. I have to have my little friend. It's like, if you know, you know. If you don't, you don't. Don't ask, don't ask me afterwards. <laughs> if you know, you know the crystal fan. All right. Uh, so ladies, you heard the word. Let's get to boot camp. Uh, right. It's now time to give. Amen. Giving time is? Amen. Giving time is blessing time. This is a wonderful time that we all get to participate. Maybe you don't get to sing in the praise and worship, you don't get to do anything else, but you, everybody gets to participate uh, when it's time to give. And just a scripture to read to encourage you this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, um, I'm going to start uh, verse 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. You get to decide, right? Nobody tells you. Uh, we already know the basic is 10%. So God tells us. But after that, you get to decide uh, what you, what you want to do. And don't give reluctantly on a response to pressure. So never be pressured to give. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will give generously all that you need. And I like verse 10. It's one of my favorites when it's time to give. Uh, verse 10 says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and bread to eat. So he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Uh, so when you give, God is not going to leave you without. He's going to give you the seed to sow, this is your seed to sow, and this is your bread to eat. Uh, so God remains faithful. In the same way, he will provide increase and your resources and then your produce, your, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So never think, oh, I'm going to give, so if I give, then I'm going to like. He gives seed to the sower and bread to eat. He gives you both. Uh, some of us are, e are, are eating our seed instead of planting it. So he gives seeds. So whenever you get an increase, uh, besides your tithes of offerings, of, besides your tithe, just 10%, whenever you get an increase, you say, God, is, is, this, is this seed or is this for me? To, is this seed or is this bread? Um, yeah, God gives bread too. It's not everything's not all seed. God gives you bread because he wants you to eat, right? So let's give God. We have four ways to give here at WC, so you can give online, the church center app, which we highly recommend. Uh, of course, you can use an offering envelope, and if you do use an offering envelope, we do have a drop box uh, out there in the lobby. You can drop it off, and um, all the ways to give are there, envelope, church center, text to give, of course, uh, you can do that as well. So let's stand to our feet, and we're going to make our confession, and I have my cheat sheet, because no, I don't have it memorized anymore. It's been a while. So you can blame Pastor Paul for that. It's been a while. All right. So you can repeat after me. It says we are recalibrating, so we're going back to some of the things that, um, that are foundational in this ministry. So repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I worship you as, as I obey your word in giving and receiving. I believe that Jesus, who is my great high priest, worships you in my behalf and pronounces my tithes and offerings blessed and multiplied according to your word so that all my needs are abundantly met. Not in a miserly way, but according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I have no lack, only God's abundance 
and Abraham's blessings are mine. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes, give him a clap offering. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. And if you need help with the church center app, just go in the lobby, uh, in the guest lounge, somebody will be there to help you. So if you haven't noticed, Pastor Paul is not here. <laughs> and he said he, f- he forgot on Sunday, just you know, slipped his mind to announce that he's going to be uh, traveling. So uh, of course he sends his greetings. I know he's watching right now. Say, so, hey, Pastor Paul, so you can see. And you know, welcome to those of you who are viewing online as well. I, I usually don't do a good job of that. So, but. Anyway, he's watching, and so he sends his love, and God used him mightily. Uh, he has two conferences back-to-back, men's conferences, and, um, you know, uh, God, again, God used him mightily as he spoke uh, to the men there uh, this past week, and then this coming week he's going to be speaking to the male pastors, uh, and then um, I'll be traveling to speak to the female pastors, the older ones and the younger ones. Um, we were hoping that Pastor Sheila will be able to make it, but she says she's not ready yet, so that's okay. So I'll be traveling alone. Um, all right. So, yes, so no way is. And so, men, you heard the announcement, right? Men. So I'm going to talk to the ladies. Uh, ladies, if, you, if your husband is sitting, if your husband is laying next to you on the 28th and it's like 5.30, you know, 5.15, 5.30, if he has a long drive, it's 5 o'clock and he's still laying there, um, you know, you know what I'll be doing. You know, you can just stop rubbing his back or something, you know, just to, to kind of the slow alarm to wake him up. Right? And he's like, hey, baby, what are you doing? Like, oh, you know, I was just reminding you about the 6 a.m. prayer. Oh, you know, I'm just believing God for miracles. You know. So, ladies, just use our wisdom, right? Get the men out here. Um, not get the men. men, you come out, but the ladies are going to encourage you. All right? And they, men, this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Seriously, if you want your woman to melt, if you want your woman to do anything that you want, be a leader, especially in terms of uh, spiritual leadership. When you do that, I'm telling you, there's nothing, there is nothing. Am I right, ladies? There is nothing that you won't be able to get out of her. You keep fussing her and complaining, oh, my wife does this. It's because you might not be leading, but we should be leading. But God is good. All right, men, be here at 6 a.m. I must stay out of that because I, I could go on. All right, so we're going to pray and we're going to uh, jump right into the word. And we're going to be continuing from where Pastor Paul left, or I'm going to be talking about where, what Pastor Paul has been talking about, the same, the same topic, con- contending for the faith, and our subtitle is Stay on the Wall. Uh, so let's pray. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for our time here this morning. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You are welcome to move freely. Lord, you know all the needs that are represented here. You know, Father God, the questions that people have. You know, Father God, the anxieties, the frustrations, and um, Lord, even the hopelessness that, that's represented in this room. So, Lord, I ask that as I speak your word, that I decrease and you increase. Lord, may I speak only what you'd have me speak. And Lord, I pray that by the time the words leave my lips and get to the ear of the hearers, it is exactly what they need to hear. We thank you, Father God, that every need is made. And serve. devil, we serve you. Notice that this place is off limits to you and your cohorts. You cannot come and interfere in any way in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for an open heaven uh, in, in our service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So Pastor Paul has been talking about contending uh, for the faith. And our scripture is Jude, um, Jude chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. That's the verses he's been used, Jude chapter 3 and 4. You can say chapter 1 if you want. There's only one chapter, but Jude um, 3 and 4. So I'm going to read from the New King James Version, and I'm going to highlight it from uh, the Passion Translation as well. It says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to, uh, to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once all for all delivered to the saints. So Jude wanted to write about something else, but he found it necessary to write about this. He says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago are marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So anybody who says Jesus Christ is not Lord, is not God, these are the people that he's warning us against, the people who, ungodly men who have crept into the church. 
I like it in the, in the Passion trans, the Translation. It says, for God through, well, it says, dear love uh, friend, I was fully intending to write to you about our amazing salvation we all participate in. I, uh, you know, wanted to share some good news, but it felt the need instead to challenge you to vigorously, vigorously defend and contend for the beliefs that we cherish. For God, through the apostles, has once for all entrusted these truths to his holy believers. There have been some who snuck in and gone unnoticed, but I like the part that we are to contend for the beliefs that we cherish. You are here because you believe something, right? You, be, you are here because you believe that Jesus came on earth, he died, was, was buried, rose again, is now seated in, in the heavenlies uh, with the heavenly father. You believe that, right? But there are people who are coming to you and telling you, mm, it's not quite that. It's something else. This is saying is Jesus and. It's no longer Jesus. It's the only way. Like there are many ways that lead to Christ. No, they are not lead, uh, lead to God. There's, no, they are not. Jesus is the only way. But there are now people that some of you are beginning to say, oh, Muhammad was a prophet too. And Jesus was a prophet. You know, all these other prophets. And oh, maybe, no. It's men. Ungodly people who have snuck into the church and now are impacting and influencing our beliefs. So the definitions that Pastor Paul gave us, uh, faith is, he said, the faith is the doctrine built on the apostles and prophets of Jesus Christ as a cornerstone. So you can go and watch the other series on YouTube. I'm not going to do as much um, recap, but I want to give the definitions that he's using. And then to contend in the Greek means to struggle or intense effort to fight for or about something, to strive in sense of physical combat, to quarrel, to dispute, to argue, to go against resistance. And that's what we're going to be doing at the boot camp, going against resistance. To res contend is to resist the forces of darkness, to give an answer for the hope that is in us, as he told us, to stand on all 10 toes. I don't know, maybe you can stand on nine toes, but stand on all 10 toes. That's what contending is. Not easily moved or tossed about. You know, this, you know, you see some people like this is the latest thing they're going on and they're here, then there's it's something else. Not easily tossed about, but people who stand firm, even as we're singing today. Where you're putting your flesh under and putting to death those lurking things in us. That is what contending is, where you are putting to death those habits, those, those, um, those tendencies that you have, those besetting sins. When you are contending, you are putting those things to death. As Colossians 3 uh, verse 5 tells us. So God is calling his people to contend for the faith, again, as we've read. We're living in a day and time where anything, everything, and anything goes. Right, our doctrine is being questioned. You're like, oh, you know, we're starting to believe what, they, what, what other people are saying. That's contrary to the word of God. It says people have crept in, people who look like sheep. But they're actually wolves in sheep's clothing. Because when you come closer to them, you're like, mm, they don't quite smell like sheep. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I was having some skin conditions and stuff like that. And so I was looking online and trying to figure out how to do it because, you know, mm, my, my, my face is like, okay, keep it together. So I ordered this um, lanolin on, on, on Amazon. And it's from, the sheep, uh, it's from the sheep. And, you know, I ordered, I saw some reviews, and I ordered it. And I opened that thing, that thing smelled like a sheep. I was like, Lord, I mean, it literally smelled like a sheep. So whenever I put it on, you know, I just try to, to mask it with something else. But there's some people who, when you get close to them, they don't quite smell like sheep. Like, mm, this, mm, the smell kind of, I know what a sheep smells like. Now I really know because I put it on my face. Now, you know, I, this doesn't quite smell like a sheep. This smells like something else. But many of you are just kind of overriding that and saying, well, yeah, maybe I don't know, you know. But there's people who have crept in. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They're blending in with the church so much that we can't tell the difference. Have you noticed? Sometimes on social media, you can't even tell who's saved and who's not saved. Unless if there's, you know, throwing a slap on a little scripture, you know, then you're like, oh, maybe they're saved. But the people have crept in. Evil people have crept in to confuse the church, to confuse the body of Christ, to make us of null effect to render us powerless. Because if we look like the world, we sound like the world, then where can the world go to? 
They're confused. They're just as confused as we are. Blending in. There's no difference now. There's been an effort to water down the gospel to make it less offensive, more seeker-friendly. No, we don't want to offend anybody, right? You know, we want, we, want, we want to have more likes and all the stuff, you know. We want to have more people come into services. No, we, we, don't, we don't want to say anything that's going to be offensive. But you know, if you come to this church, we preach the word of God. If you're offended, we pray for you. You get over it, all right? You can cry, whatever, you get over it, and we pat you on the back, now let's get back in the game. But we are sticking to the word. We don't care what anybody says. We don't care what becomes popular. Their foundation has been set here. Pastor others contended for the faith. He stood flat-footed. He didn't care what people said. People ridiculed him. He did not care. What does the word of God have to say about this situation? It may not be popular. And we're coming now into the season when things, you know, that we believe are no longer popular. They're old-fashioned. They're antiquated. You know, we've evolved. Have you? The word, if the word of God is not evolved, why am I evolving? 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 9. And I'm going to read verse 5. It says, we should know these things in the last days. There will be difficult times. You know, verse 5, I'm going to jump to verse 5. It says, people will act religious, but they'll reject the power that could make them godly. So they'll look like sheep, but they will not be sheep. Stay away from people like that. Contending means sometimes you have to stay away from people like that. They're the kind who work their way into homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. You know, as, I'm reading, as I was reading this, it's like people now are creating doctrines to cover up their sin. Right? Because I don't want to have to repent. I don't want to have to live, you know, holy. I'm going to now create a doctrine to cover up my sin. I want to love more than one person. I want to be in a relationship. I have a, I have a lot of love to give. So I need to have other relationships. We create these doctrines to, you know, to make us feel better about it, you know, because the word of God is like, ooh, it's too offensive. Mm-mm. So now we come, we're coming up with our own doctrines to make us feel good about our sin. See, you, know, you don't have to go to church every day, every week. No. Man, once a month or you know, twice a year, is, that's enough. You can be a CEO Christian and God sees. You can just be watching online all year long, never fellowship with your, you know, with your brothers and sisters because God understands. We're creating these doctrines to make us feel good about ourselves. But Jude is warning us, be careful for these people. Verse 7 says, such women are forever following new teachings. There's a new teaching here, we go here. There's a new prophet here, we go here. There's a new this, we, we everywhere, we everywhere. But never rooted. These, these teachers oppose the truth that Moses taught us. So these, these are the days that we're living in. When the word of God is no longer popular. The word of God is just, it's just too harsh. It's like, you know, you know, I heard one political leader said, you know, people don't have to change their faith or abandon their deeply held beliefs to agree that the government should not be telling a woman to do what to do with her body. It's like, do you? You know, go to church, do what you need to do, just, you know, and do something else. You know, believe in re- all these reproductive rights that we're talking about. Believe, you don't have to change. These are people who've crept in. In other words, we can mix the word of God with demonic beliefs. The word of God tells us here that in the last days, you know, false prophets will arise, and they've already risen here. They're going to perform miracles the same way, you know, godly men perform miracles. They're going to perform miracles as well. And that's in an effort to confuse us because we're not going to. That's why you have to contend for the faith, be rooted and grounded, where we can worship God and we can have crystals too. Right? We can worship God and we can follow the zodiac signs. We can worship God and pledge to Greek gods in the name of brotherhood or sisterhood. We can do it all. It's okay. You don't, you don't have to give up your beliefs. Jesus and his people who have crept in. We can date, you know, and have sex outside of marriage. You know, it's, it's, it's just amazing to me. Really, really amazing and really troubling how normalized it has now, it has become that people who are in a relationship move in together, 
have sex together, we love each other, we're planning on getting married. These things are normalized. They are not normal. Tell your neighbor, that's not normal. And these are people who believe the word of God, who call on the name of Jesus. We have something to contend for. Now, Pastor Paul, again, that was an introduction. He was, he was telling us um, about Nehemiah. He, put, he picked Nehemiah as one of the contenders that we're going through. So we're going to talk, we're going to go to the book of Nehemiah. He was one who contended for the faith. Because evil men had crept in. Uh, in Nehemiah, we can go to chapter 1. Let's just give you some information about Nehemiah. Um, he was a governor of Judah from 20 to 30, uh, 20 to 32 year of uh, Artaxerxes. Yeah, that's his name. From now on, we call him King Art. All right, because his name is Artaxerxes. Okay. <laughs> he, he, he was a cupbearer to King Art. You know, but in the previous book, you know, Ezra, uh, in the previous book before Nehemiah, we read about Ezra who was a priest who'd gone uh, to, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And in fact, King Cyrus, who was not a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had, be, had been moved to uh, encourage the people to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So they went back and, you know, Ezra helped with the supply, um, King Cyrus helped with the supplies. So this isn't just a word of encouragement. Never fear that just because somebody does not believe in God, God can still use that person to meet your need. God, absolutely. God can still do That's why God did with King Cyrus. He was not a believer, but God used him. And so now the temple has been built, but uh, the walls around the city have been torn down. They've been destroyed by fire. And so this is where we pick up uh, in the book of Nehemiah. And so Nehemiah is, is there and, you know, he's in exile because the children of Israel were disobedient, so they were taken to exile. And so Nehemiah is now working as a cupbearer for the king. And now as he's working for the cupbearer of the king, he asks those people who had come from Judah, it's like, hey, how are, things ha how are things going over there? And he hears the bad news about what's happening, and now he prays, and he, you know, he asks God for favor, and God uses King's, King Art to say, hey, go back. And he gives him all the resources that he needs in order for him to go back and rebuild the walls so that the temple that had been built can be protected. So this is, you can read uh, again through the book of Nehemiah yourself. So... This is the background of Nehemiah. So what we're going to do today is kind of learn some lessons from Nehemiah, who contended for the faith, a man who stayed on the wall. Chapters, we're going to be focusing on chapters 1 through 6, and so we, won't, we won't go through the whole book, chapters 1 through 6. So let's go back. So we, we, uh, we're in uh, chapter 1. Again, the story I just told, he hears the story about what's happening in, uh, in Judah, and his heart uh, just really breaks um, it says in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, well, I'll go back so I can read it. Um, verse 2 it says, Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked him about the Jews who had returned, from there, uh, returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, Things are not going well. For those, who return to the province, for, for those who return to the province of Judah, they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and gates have been, destro have been destroyed by fire. Nehemiah writes, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. What did, what did Nehemiah do when he heard what was happening to Jerusalem? He wept, he prayed, and he fasted. So in order for you to be a contender, you have to have a burden. Nehemiah got the burden. As soon as he heard the word, he got the burden, and he went into prayer and fasting and weeping before God. He didn't say, oh, ooh, oops, that's too bad. You know, I hope they can figure it out. No, he got the burden, again, for the people of God, for the work of God, because the walls have been destroyed. How many of us have a burden for the moral walls that have been destroyed? Families that are now divided, especially these days over politics, families divided, over secrets, things that have happened in families. We are, how many of us are weeping, have a burden for families where the walls of unity have been broken down? Where we are to be united as in the body of Christ, we are now more divided than we've ever been. 
And that's the tactic of the enemy to weaken the church, to make us of no effect. Because when the church is weak, then there is nothing holding off the curse. When the church is weak, there's nothing that's holding back God's judgment. The church is weak. And that's been the enemy's tactic to come in. But when, 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 when Nehemiah heard this, he got the burden. Do you have a burden for the work of God? Do you lose any sleep praying for people? Do you fast for others or is it just all about you? Do you have a burden for others? Nehemiah had the burden for the work of God. If we don't have a burden for the work of God, we're going to come week in and week out and watch the same people serving and never serve. You say, oh, these people are so good. They're so faithful. Oh, wonderful. No. Ask God to give you a burden and say, what can I do? I can stand and smile. I can welcome visitors. I can work with kids if, you, if you're good with kids. What are you doing? Do you have a burden? Or is it just all about you? Do you have a burden for your loved ones who are not, who are not saved? Do you have a burden for your neighbors that are literally dying and going to hell? Do you have a burden? Nehemiah got a burden and he went into prayer and fasting and weeping before God. Ask God to give you a burden for the work of God. Ask God to give you a burden for his people. Ask God to give you a heart that, that he has for his people. A heart that weeps over sin. A heart that weeps when people are refusing to obey the word of God. Nehemiah had a burden. In order for us to contend, we can't just say this is somebody else's issue. It's your issue. The fact that you've heard, the fact that you're even hearing this message today, God brought you here to hear this, now it's become your issue. What are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about some of the you know, people in the church that need ministry? God has given you a heart and you love working with the senior saints, you love working with the silver saints, whatever they want to call themselves, season saints, the older people. Some are just lonely in their homes. What can you do? What can you do? Have a burden. Some of us, God speaks to us, but then we just push it to the side, like, well, you know, somebody else can do it, you know, the ministers or the pastors. No, it's you. It's your issue as well in the body of Christ. Nehemiah had a burden. He was moved to do something. He went into prayer. When he, as soon as he heard it, he got that burden and said, God, God, we cannot be saved. Oh, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfading love with those who love, his, who love him and obey his commands. And listen to my prayer. He went straight to prayer. To contend, you've got to have a burden. Otherwise, there's nothing. You know, why, why are you going to bother yourself, you know, standing for the faith, defending the faith? I have my own stuff going on. But a real contender realizes that one person being lost is one too many. Realizes if there's a small gap, it's one gap too many. We've got to close the gap. That's what a contender, a contender has a burden for the work of God, a burden for the people of God, a burden for souls. Oh God, give us a burden for souls. God, make us so uncomfortable that whenever, wherever we go and we are around people who are not saved, give us no rest. You know when the Spirit, Holy Spirit gets to you, you're like, okay. You know, your heart starts racing and all this stuff starts happening. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Contending requires a life of prayer and fasting. And praying and fasting being the first resort, as we saw with Nehemiah. His first resort was to go and pray. At every turn, Nehemiah was running to God. In chapter 1, verse 11, he prayed for favor. In chapter 2, verse 4, you know, when the king asked him what's going on, he says, before he answered, he prayed to God. How many of us even pray before we answer? Or are we just answering however we want to answer? And now when we open our mouth and we start talking, we get ourselves into trouble. Slow it down. Slow it down. I'm telling you, the 15 to 30 seconds that you uh, pause will make a huge difference in whether this conversation is going to go south or is going to remain Christ-like. Learn to pause. I'm telling you, 15 to 30 seconds. That makes a huge difference. It changes. First of all, you get to calm down. You pause. You get to think. And you're thinking you can even be praying, Lord, how do I answer this? Instead of just answering just because you can. 
every time, in every turn, Nehemiah was, was, was praying. He prayed in chapter 4, verse 4, when the mocking began. He prayed in chapter 4, verse 9. He prayed to God, you know, when, when, uh, for, for protection. He prayed to God for, to God for God to bless him in chapter 5, verse 19. In verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 14, he prayed again. At every turn, Nehemiah was praying. Some of us would do everything else, and then we pray. Prayer should be your first resort. Before you pick up the phone and start calling that person, you pray first. And then others can come in agreement with you, but you pray. Some of us just want other people to pray for us. We don't want to do any praying. Or if we do, it's the last resort. It's like, oh, I've tried A, B, C, D. Okay, now I'm on F. I need, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to pray. Prayer ought to be, as a contender, it has to be your first resort. Prayer and fasting. You know, uh, there's going to be a time of prayer and fasting. October, Pastor Paul says, is going to be October prayer and fasting. We're going to be praying and fasting because we are contenders for the faith. We are the ones who are holding back, holding back destruction on this nation. We are the ones who are holding back uh, destruction. So in this city, contending requires sacrifice. Nehemiah chapter, we're still in chapter one, verse 11. It requires sacrifice, the last part. It says, when Nehemiah heard this, and you know, his heart was, he got the burden for the work of God, and he could not rest, he could not sleep, he could not eat, you know, and then he, um, he, he's going before the king. He says he was a cupbearer. He's telling us that Nehemiah was a cupbearer. In other words, he had a very prominent position because he worked with the king. He's the one who would taste the food before the king ate. All right, so if, if, if it was poison in the food, then Nehemiah, I guess, would have died. But Nehemiah is the one who tasted the food, and the king had to trust him. So he had a very, it, things that are coming to the king's mouth, Nehemiah was in, was in charge of that. So he had a great position. But because of the burden, because his heart was weeping, he said, I need to leave this position. I need to go back to Jerusalem. I need to go back and do something. He left his nice, cushy, plush position in order for him to go back and rebuild the walls. God is going to require us to sacrifice some things as contenders. What is God calling you to sacrifice? You know, maybe you don't want to lose your friends. Like, you know your friends are, are in sin, and they're still supposed to be believers, but you know they're in sin, and, but you know, you're not calling them out because you're afraid to lose friendship. You're going to have to sacrifice something as a contender. Contending is not comfortable. Because you are literally going against resistance. The flow is good. The current is going this way, but you're going against the current as a contender. In other words, you have to sacrifice some things. You have to travel light. The people that you hung around with before have been weighing you down. Now it's time to say, you know what? I love you. I'm going to pray for you, but I got to go. What are some things you need to sacrifice? We talked about meals. We need to sacrifice your reputation. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 7 says, Jesus made himself of no reputation. He didn't think of his equality with God as something to cling on to. Some of us are clinging on to the reputation that we have. Like if people really knew on my job that I am a believer, then they might start treating me differently, so I'm just going to, you know, be an undercover Christian. No, God is saying, I want you to sacrifice. I want you to be bold about this thing. Yes, you're going to lose family. Yes, you're going to lose friends. But it's okay. It's better for you to be, to, to be, um, to be, in, in, um, to be blessed by God rather than people praising you. Would you rather have the favor of God than the favor of men? You kind of have to sacrifice some things. What has God been telling you to let go of? Is it fear? You want to open your mouth and say something. But now you hear the saying, do it afraid. We just have to open our mouth. When you open our mouth, then the Holy Spirit is going to give us the words to speak. We have to sacrifice some things as a contender. It's not going to be comfortable. You might lose some followers on social media. Right? Whenever we get up here and preach the word of God, we know that there's some people will be like, mm, no, it's too much, mm, too much Jesus, too much, you know, it's too harsh. No, I don't, I don't want that. But that's okay. We'll sacrifice those things because we'd rather be in line with the word of God than to be popular with men. 
Nehemiah did not care. He says, I'm going to leave all this that I have, and I'm going to go and go in that hot sun and rebuild the wall. A contender has to sacrifice. Contending, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, requires linking up with like-minded people. You can't, do this, you can't do this journey alone. Chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God, so he goes and he's, you know, he scouts out the, the wall, and then, and then he finds his people. He says, Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me uh, and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, Yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. Are you linked up with the right people? Are you linked up with people who are dragging you down slowly? You know, some people say, I need to hang out with these people because I want to win them. Now, who's winning who? Are you winning them or are they winning you? Because now you started changing the way that you talk, the way that you're reading the word of God. Now you're reading with different lens. You're creating your own doctrines just to make yourself feel good about the sin that you're in. As a contender, you have to be linked with like-minded people. That's why it's important for you to come to church because now you're linked with like-minded people. At the same time, there's some who've crept in here. But at least you can find your like-minded people here. Ephesians chapter, um, no, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 12 says, Two are better than one, because if one falls, the other will lift him up. Some of you are trying to live this isolated Christian life. Like, oh, I can just do this on my own. Oh, I pray by myself. Oh, I have a sweet, wonderful time with the Holy Spirit. I don't need to go to church. You're lying, you. Because guess what? When the enemy comes to tempt you, there's nobody to say no. There's nobody to hold you accountable. Some of us, we like this isolation, you know, Christianity, because we don't want to be told anything. We don't want to be told, mm, the way that you spoke, that was not Christ-like. The things that you are doing behind closed doors, those are not Christ-like. God sees. You think just because the pastor doesn't see, God sees. We need people who are like-minded people who are going to call us out on our foolishness. You want to be by yourself because you want to be called out. You think, oh, I'm deep. and No, no, you're not. And the, and the enemy likes that. He likes to pull us away. Because when he pulls us away, then he can come and have his way with us. When he pulls us away, then it's no longer the word of God, no longer becomes the authority. We start, you know, using our own imagination and thinking and, you know, again, coming up with our own doctrines. The contending requires that we link it up with the like-minded people. Are you involved in prayer? Does anybody call you when you're not in prayer? Who are you accountable to? Who knows when you're not here? Some of you like it that way. Right? I don't want anybody to know when and I'm here because, you know, there might be times when I'm just not feeling it these days. I don't want to be in church. No. That means you're not contending for the faith. A contender is one who links up with like-minded people. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, when the people became afraid, Nehemiah told them, do not be afraid. Do you have people like that who are going to encourage you when you're feeling weak, when you're feeling overwhelmed, who are going to call you and say, no, stay on the wall. Do not be discouraged. Do not fear. Do you have people like that? Or are you trying to do this thing on your own? A contender requires, contending requires like, linking with like-minded people. Hmm. This one here. Contenders will suffer ridicule and persecution. You know, some of us, that's why we don't like to be, you know, we, are, we don't want to do too much because we, we're trying to hide from persecution. But guess what? Wherever you go, it's going to come. So you might as well be with other people who are, who are on the same journey as you and you can encourage each other. But it, it brings ridicule and persecution. Chapter 2, verse 19. It says, when Sanballat and Tobiah... And Geshem, these are the, the rascals here who are, I'm telling you, these were um, the people sent to really um, persecute Nehemiah. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? They asked. The people were ridiculing him. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, it says, the Sanballat was very angry when he learned we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews. 
Have you ever been mocked by other people? Have you ever been mocked even on social media for saying the right thing? It says in verse 2, saying in front of his friends, so now he has, you know, he has his whole posse with him. And the Samaritan, uh, Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day? And Nehemiah never said, I want to build the wall in a single day. But uh, they think they can build the wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make stones, something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? To buy the Ammonite who was standing beside him remarked, you know, that, you know people like um, Marcus like company as well. It says, so Tobias says, that stone wall would collapse even if a fox walked along the top of it. You trying to live God, you, you trying to live for God, that thing will never work. You trying to give, you are going to lack. You giving your money to the church, oh no, you're going to lack. Says, that thing will never work. You have markers, even your own family is looking at you like you're a fanatic. Your own family, they know, oh, you know, uh, at family gatherings, like, oh gosh, here she comes, here he comes. Everybody hold on to your hair, hold on to your, you know, hold on to, because this person's about to come and they're going to share the gospel. They look at you as a fanatic, but that's okay. You are a contender. Be prepared for that. Jesus told us these things. He says in the last days there'll be mockers coming, mocking the truth. They will say, oh, you're talking about Jesus is coming. How long has it been? You've been talking about Jesus is coming. Do you really, do you really think he's coming? You're wasting your time going to church every Sunday. You could, you could be resting and relaxing. You work so hard during the week. You need to be... No. As a contender, you're going to suffer ridicule and persecution. But that's okay. When people call you names on social media, when people say, you know, when people unfollow you, people who, who were once your friends and now all of a sudden they're unfollowing you, it's okay. Jesus warned us about these things. He was telling the disciples, John chapter 15, that he says, the world has hate, if the world hates me, the world is going to hate you too. Some of us, we don't like people to hate us. We want to be nice to everybody. We want everybody to like us. If everybody likes you, nobody has an issue with you, then there's a problem. That means you're not contending. If nobody's ever offended by the word of God that that you are speaking, by this truth that you're speaking, then there is something wrong. Jesus told us, he said that the world hated me. Now why are we as Christians, we're crying? Like, oh, they're persecuting the church. Yes, they are. But Jesus told us about these things already. And he tells us in John chapter 16, verse 1, he says, I'm telling you these things so that you do not abandon your faith. Some of us have been contending for a while, but now things are getting a little heated, and now we're beginning to abandon your faith. Jesus says, I told you these things, that the world is going to hate you. That when we speak the word of God, we are, going, we are going to be censored on social media. Yeah, several times the word of God has been preached here and we've been censored on YouTube. Because the stuff we're preaching is too offensive. But guess what? We get back up there again and we keep preaching the gospel. We're not going to be moved. Because pers- Jesus said these things are going to come. In John chapter 16 verse 33, he tells us. Things are going to come, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Do not be moved when people hate you. Do not be, they hated me, so they're going to hate you. Don't feel sorry for yourself, like, oh, poor Christians, oh, it's doom and gloom. No. Oh, they're hating us, no problem. We're going to push even further. They're trying to silence our voices. We're going to speak even louder. They're trying to censor us. It doesn't matter. We're going to speak even louder. Persecution is here. It's not coming. It's already here. What they're going to require us as a church to marry same-sex people. Or you lose your tax exemption status. The times are here already. Well, when you say something is wrong, that they say is, is, is good, then they're going to throw you in prison. They're going to shut you up. Persecution and contender understands that ridicule and persecution comes with the job. Don't feel sorry for yourself like, oh, people don't like me. Good. Are you preaching? Okay. 
Are you preaching the word of God, speaking the truth in love? Or, you know, some people won't like you because you're just ugly. All right, use the way that you speak, the way that you talk to people. So, ah, I, have to t- yeah, I have to talk to that somebody. Like, oh, yes, I don't care. People don't like me. I don't care. No, come on. Are you Christ-like in your communication? Or am I, I'm just going to tell it the way it is. I'm just going to tell it the way it is. No. Let your words be seasoned with grace. You don't get into coarse joking. Yeah, some people are pulling away from you not because you, they, they see Jesus all over you. They see wickedness, they don't want to be a part of that. But if you're speaking the truth of the word of God in love, be prepared for persecution. Be prepared for you not to be popular. That's okay. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7, you know, uh, verse 7 to 8, at first it was just a few people, but now they gathered more people. At first it should just be a couple of people, maybe just two people in your family that don't like you, you know, they think you're just doing too much, you, you know, you, 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 you just pray too much and you just speak the word of God too much. But now they go and they gather more people. Are you going to be able to stand when now you have a whole group of people who are standing against you, who are persecuting you, who are ridiculing you, who are mocking you? Are you going to be able to stand? Nehemiah had the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites. More people came to mock because a couple of people are like, okay, he's not, he's not getting the message. Now nah, let's go. Let's, let's have more of us. Are you going to be able to stand? We have to be able to stand as contenders. We have to be able to stand, to stay on the wall. That doesn't matter what the enemy does. You know, in, in chapter 4, verse 8, you know, it tells us, um, <clears throat> in chapter 4, it says, they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to throw you into confusion. He wants you to take you off your game. Because if he can take you off your game, but now you're no longer effective in the kingdom of God. When you try to witness to people, people are not going to hear because now he's taking you off the game. The enemy is going to try whatever he can to distract you, to frustrate you. To create confusion in your marriage, create confusion in your finances, in your body. The enemy is going to do whatever he can to take you off your game, to bring sickness and disease upon you, upon your family, because he wants you to, he wants to take you off your game. Persecution is going to come. You're busy putting out fires every day. You know, you wake up, like, okay, now who needs me? Who do, you know? That's what the enemy wants you to do, just confuse him, busy. Because when you do that, you don't have time to contend for the faith. You don't have time to go against the current. He may not be, the enemy may not be able to stop you, but he's going to try to create confusion. He's going to just have these little things that are always happening in your life. You know, week one is your car, week two is the refrigerator, week three is the kids, week four is the job, week five is, it's always something happening. Because he says, you know what, this person is running too hard against the current. I need to get to slow them down a little bit. But you can't refuse and stay on the wall because the enemy wants to confuse you. The enemy wants to bring discouragement in your life to take you off your game. The attacks were relentless in chapter 6, 19. They, were, they kept coming. They never stopped. Even after the wall was built, there were still more attacks that were coming. Relentless. The people here were busy biting. Chapter 6, 19 tells us, you know, they will go to Nehemiah and, and hear what Nehemiah is saying. Then they run to Tobiah and they tell Tobiah what Nehemiah is saying. They, 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 they get information from Tobiah. Now they run to Nehemiah and say, this is what Tobiah is saying. Some of us are just busy bodies. We're like a switchboard for gossip. You tuned in. You know what, every, what everybody, everybody is doing. What's happening with it? Why? Why do you know all that stuff? Ask yourself why. All these things are tactics of the enemy to create confusion in our lives, to weaken us. He says, stay away from people like that. When people come and attack you, say, you know what? I, Nehemiah says, I'm not coming down the wall. I'm not coming down. Requires discernment. Contending requires discernment. Chapter 6, verse 2. Contending requires discernment. He says, so, the, so Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at the villages on the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. You have to have discernment as a contender. You have to have discernment as a person who stays on the wall and does not come down. You have to have discernment. Things are going to sound good, but is this, is this God speaking? Or is this somebody else speaking? 
They even used a prophet to go to Nehemiah and say, you know, come, let's go into the, into the temple. Let's bolt the doors because if we bolt the doors, then we'll be safe because they're coming to kill you tonight. He was trying to instill fear in Nehemiah, but Nehemiah was discerning. He says, hmm, if I come down, then people are going to see that I'm afraid. Then I'm going to become just like them. How many of us are being put into situations because we, you know, we didn't have any discernment? Compromising situations because we did not have any discernment. As a contender, you have to pray for God to give you discernment. You have, that's why you have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You, know, you have to pray before you answer. You have to br- pray before you just agree to anything and everything that's said. Not every invitation is for you to go to. Some of us have put ourselves in situations we should never have been in because we, did not, we were not discerning to realize that these people, they look like they're in my corner, but they're not. They're trying to weaken me because they see that I'm running hard after Christ. They're trying to make me lukewarm like them. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to neutralize me. And you go like, ooh. And now sometimes, you, you, sometimes um, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and you're able to kind of move out of the place. But other, sometimes you just get caught up in the current. A contender has to have discernment. Nehemiah was, was, a discerning, was a discerning man. He knew these people were up to no good. That's why he prayed at every turn, because he knew that their tactic was to intimidate them, to make Nehemiah ordinary just like anybody else. Nehemiah did not care about his life. He said, should I worry about my own life? He knew that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. He was not moved. I said, God, give me, give me that grace not to be moved by persecution, even by death itself. Because to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Some of us are afraid you're going to lose your job. Hey, if you keep, you know, if you keep, if they see you reading your Bible during lunchtime, you're going to lose your job. You're like, ooh, I don't want to lose my job. Discerning that these people are not hearing from God. They've been sent by the evil one. Because the evil one, the enemy knows, now he's, he's thrown everything at you, but now he's using, he's using the voice of God, supposedly the prophets, to speak to you and to get you out and to get you to come down off the wall. That's why it's important that you've got to have a pastor. Who, do you have a pastor? Who watches over your soul? Or are you going from church to church? Visiting this prophet, that prophet, this, you know, the latest revival over here, the latest this thing over here. What? You gotta be rooted and planted. Because they're going to be people who are going to sound wonderful. They're going to sound like Jesus himself speaking. But they have been sent by, they've crept in, they've slithered in. They become comfortable, and they, you know, they kind of watch you like, oh, this person, yeah, this is their weakness. So, okay, I'm going to come, and I'm going to talk about, um, hmm, I'm going to talk about money, because I know that's their weakness. And they come here, oh, you know, this money thing that they do at the church, you know, this is too much. You know, you should not be doing that, you know. Or whatever it is, whatever, whatever weakness that you have, the enemy is going to come to people and, and speak to you, and it's going to sound like the voice of God, but it is not. You've got to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. You've got to have a man of God that watches over your soul so that you're not listening to any voice and every voice that's out there. Some of us spend a whole week listening to YouTube preachers, that preacher, that preacher. Just because they're on YouTube and have a lot of followers does not mean they're preaching the gospel. Just because they have a lot of TikTok TikTok, uh, followers does not mean they're preaching the gospel. Be careful, be careful, be careful. So it's important to have a church home. Have a pastor that feeds you the word of God. You know, Pastor Arthur's told us here that he's, he's, you know, follow him as he follows Christ. And he says, if at any point I start following Christ, don't follow me. Follow Christ. But some of us, whatever, the latest. Ooh, have you seen this one? I'm going over this one. Next week I'm going over this one. No, be rooted and planted. So if you don't have a church home, shameless plug, this is a good, safe place to be for you to be. We are a multi-generational church. There's a reason why people have been here for years and years and end. Amen? Amen. Hmm. Contending requires that we armor up. I'm going to close up very quickly. 
If, uh, you can read this, uh, ne- Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13 to 23. It requires that we, we armor up. You know, Nehemiah, when he was told what was going on, he did not ignore wisdom. He said, oh, they're, go- they're wanting to come and attack us. Now, everybody, everybody, you work with a, with a tool, with a hammer, but you also have a weapon. You work with a hammer, you also have a weapon. He was wise. He said, we've got to armor up because the enemy is going about seeking who he may devour. He knew that we have to put on the whole armor of God according to Ephesians 6. He did not say, well, just because God has called me to do something, you know, I don't care about what they're saying. What they're... No, you got to operate in wisdom and you've got to armor up. He needed to do that because the enemy was plotting and scheming. He was trying to find a weakness, you know. And, you know, this, this is, this is you know, uh, quite funny because what, what happens is... Um, you know, he goes, um, Sanballat goes to, uh, maybe Tobiah goes to, to Nehemiah and said, oh, no, you know, we have a letter from the king. You know, it was an open letter from the king. Not, not knowing that Nehemiah worked for the king himself. So if the, if the, if the king had a message for Nehemiah, he wasn't going to send it through Tobiah or Sanballat. Sometimes the enemy will overplay his hands. But he's just trying to get you to come down off the wall. You've got to armor up. They never took off their armor, verse 23 tells us. They never took it off. Some of us who say, ooh, okay, I've done, I'm done with church now. I put on my, my armor down, then I'm just going to live my life the way I want to live. Keep your armor on because the enemy hates you. If you do not know that. Because he hates God, he hates the children of God. And his full-time job is to find a way to take you out. Some of us have part-time Christianity, but the enemy is working full-time. Why are you working part-time? We have to remain armored up. We have to have the whole armor of God. We have to remain vigilant. We have to remain sober. Don't get all drunk up with this politics these days. Some of us are drunk with politics. Sober up. Because that thing is designed to take you out. That thing is designed to take your children out because now you are compromising with the world. Armor up and sober up. A contender armors up. A contender requires, contender requires uh, remaining unmoved by eternal pressures. Hebrews, uh, Nehemiah 4.10 tells us that the very people that Nehemiah was working with, they began to complain. Oh, we can't do this thing. This is too hard. The people are tired. Sometimes the pressures are going to come from within. The very people you linked up with who are like-minded, sometimes they will change. But you don't change. If they change, pray for them, but you keep moving. It requires that we are unmoved by internal pressures. Because the enemy knows, okay, I can, if I use external pressures, the, the person is not moving. Now I need to use somebody who is very close to them. Somebody who has been their friend, somebody who has been walking with them. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your children. Internal pressure. Do not be moved by internal pressures. People will tell you whatever, but you do not be moved. People will say, this thing is not working. You've been serving God all these years. Aren't you tired? Don't you just want to sin a little bit? Don't you want to just have fun? I'm telling you as a believer, I thank God I have a lot of fun. I love to dance. So I'm telling you, as soon as, you know, not, 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 not this music here, but the other, the other <laughs> not the quiet organ, but the other music, you start beating it, I, you know, my, my body, it's just, it's just starts, I'm, not, I'm not trying, it just starts doing its thing. I have fun as a believer. I don't have to go in the water, I have fun. But some will tell you like, mm, you know, the servant God, you're boring. It's okay. Don't be moved by internal pressures. What am I saying to you today? Nehemiah was a man who stayed on the wall. Everything was thrown at him, but Nehemiah refused to be moved. They begged him, they pleaded with him, they, 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 they tried to deceive him, they tried to do whatever they can, but he said, why should I come down? I need to stay on the wall. The media might be telling us that we are too radical for believing the word of God, but don't be moved. Stay on the wall. When they say, why have your beliefs not evolved? Don't be moved. Stay on the wall. Don't fall into the trap just because society says a child can choose their gender. Like, oh, yes, they can. No, that's a trap. Stay on the wall. Don't be moved. 
Now I'm going to step on somebody's toes here. Don't be moved when they tell you about reproductive rights for women. Because what they're telling us is we need to abort our children. I said, oh, no, it's for medical necessity. And I did, I did a little research. You can do your own research, too. I went to the, into the National Library uh, of Medicine, and they told me that most, now with all the technology that's there, they, try, they will try to, if, if the mother's life is, is, um, is, at, um, is at risk, they will take the baby out, even if it's premature, and save both the mother and the baby. So the medical necessity that we're hearing about, 1.1. 1.4% is sometimes medically necessary. They actually say if they have to abort the child because of the mother's health, then medicine has failed because they should have figured out a way to get the baby out, save the baby and the mother. But we hear reproductive, like, yes! The 25 abortions that were done you know, outside in Chicago during the DNC, were those all medically necessary? But we hear, like, yes, of course, the government tell me what to do with my body. Hmm, it's quiet in this church. <laughs> Contenders, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Stay on the wall of righteousness. Don't be deceived. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter who says, who, you know, your, your favorite person is saying this, your favorite uh, Hollywood star or your favorite preacher is saying something else that's contrary to the word of God. Do not be moved. Stay on the wall. Young person, don't say, well, I can just watch pornography. Nobody will see me. You know, the pastor won't hear about it. Nobody will, will see me. Stay on the wall. Refuse. Even though it's coming on your phone, you don't even have to work for it. Stay on the wall. Refuse to be moved. Because you are contending for your faith. You are going against the current. When people are saying you're talking too much about righteousness, talk even louder. Refuse to be moved. Stay on the wall. It's not a popular thing. But if we don't, then who? If we don't stay on the wall and rebuild this wall, do our children have any hope? Think about it. Do your grandchildren have any hope? Or are they going to know? We're already living in a very different world. Imagine if we don't contend for the faith and speak against sin and promote righteousness, even though it's not popular. Some of you are upset with me. I, I, I do not care. <laughs> Stand to your feet. Some of us, the word of God has been preached, and you already know the places where you need to repent. But I want to talk to that person. You've been feeling, you've been under a lot of pressure in life. You've been trying to stay on the wall. You've been trying, but things have just not been going well in your life. You're feeling discouraged. You find yourself slipping, you're trying, you're doing the very things that you don't want to do are the things that you are doing. The things that you want, to, you, you want to do, you're not able to do those things. But the Spirit of God is here today. And He wants to encourage you to stay on the wall. It doesn't matter what things look like. It doesn't matter if your family looks like, you know, um, the, your family doesn't want to be with you anymore. It, does, it, does, it doesn't matter. Stay on the wall. Do not be moved. Do not compromise. Some of you saying, I've been serving God, I've been believing God for something for so many years, but it has not happened yet. Do not be moved. Stay on the wall. God is faithful. He remains faithful. If you are faithful, He remains faithful. Even sometimes when we are not faithful, He remains faithful. Stay on the wall. People say you've been believing God for this thing, this job for a long time, nothing is happening. Stay on the wall. You've been working hard on this job and it doesn't seem you're getting like a promotion. Stay on the wall. You be consistent. You show up every day and you do your work with excellence. Stay on the wall. The doctor has given you a bad report. Don't come down and go and consult. Stay on the wall. What challenges are you facing today? See, I've been trying to stay on the wall, but today I need a little encouragement. I've been trying to follow the word of God. I've been doing it. 
But things just seem to be going further south. The word of God wants to encourage you. As you're contending for your faith, things are not going to be perfect. But God watches over you. God has never left you. He's never forsaken you. God is not a man that he should lie and the son of man that should repent. God is not about to start with you. God's word remains true. Believe the word of God. Believe the word of God. Speak the word of God. Eat the word of God. Believe the word of God. But stay on that wall. Refuse to be moved. Father God, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us, O oh God. Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord. You're giving us a boldness to stand in the face of adversity. You're giving us a boldness, oh God, to stand when people say things, when, when people think we are, we are too righteous or we are too, we are too fanatic. Give us a boldness to stand and boldly declare your word. The Lord, even when the enemy throws everything at us, help us, oh God, to remain steadfast, immovable, unshaken. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Give us a boldness to go against every fiery dart of the enemy. Give us that boldness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you need somebody to pray with you and encourage you, maybe you've been trying to stay on that wall, but ever so often you're slipping in. The pastors and ministers are here to come past the ministers. You can come forward. Some of you need just, you just need somebody to touch and agree with you. Say, you know, I've been doing this thing. I'm, I'm needing just to link up with somebody of like-mindedness because I'm feeling myself becoming overwhelmed. I'm feeling myself being taken out, you know, by the, by the forces of darkness. If that is you, but be, as, as they're coming, if, this is, if you have never received Jesus Christ into your heart, you've never prayed the prayer, you've never opened up your heart to Jesus and welcomed him into your heart, today is a good day for you to do that. Say, Jesus, I want you into my heart. Jesus, I welcome you into my heart. Today is a good day to say, I'm going to let go of my way of living and I'm going to live according to the word of God. Today is a good day to, to invite Jesus into your heart. Is anybody here, you've never prayed the prayer? You never prayed the prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Thank you, Jesus. The pastors and ministers are here. Maybe if you don't want to raise your hand, that's okay. The pastors and ministers are here. Come, let them pray. Some of you need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, because you've been trying to, do, to contend for your faith, you know, in your own flesh, in your own might. But you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And you get it, as, and, uh, and, you, uh, uh, and you can pray using your prayer language. Because when you're doing that, you are edifying yourself. You're strengthening yourself to war against the, the, the forces of darkness. If that is you, come forward. The pastors and ministers will be here to pray for you. Father God. We just thank you again for bringing us here today. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that as your word was preached, Lord, you know where the needs are. So we thank you, God, that it, the needs are met. And Lord, even as we get ready to leave this place, we live under your guidance and protection. We declare that no hurt, harm, danger, accident, or mishap will come anywhere near us. We're reaching our destination safely. And we thank you, Father God, we're having a great week, a productive week, a week, oh God, where we are intentionally contending for the faith, intentionally staying on the wall, even if it's difficult, we're intentionally staying on that wall this week in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father God. We speak your protection again, your people, no hurt, harm, danger. Thank you, Father God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord calls his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Wheaton Christian Center, listen, Jesus, wonderful. All right, don't go without your needs met. If you need somebody to link up with you and pray with you, encourage you, come forward.